We're continuing in our series of faith and film, and today's film is the Titanic. And just as we looked at A Wrinkle in Time last week and what it means to love um, yourself, we're looking at what it means to love others um, in this film. These are the two greatest commandments. Here's a rabbi who says that all of scripture might be summed up in the commandments to love God and to love neighbor, and that everything else is just commentary. And so we're looking at both of these themes today, and I want to play with this phrase of saving love as we go through it. Think of it as the adjective saving, um, love that saves us, and then as a gerund, sorry, geek out with me for a second in grammar, um, and verb of how we are called to save love. So saving love for us and saving love itself. Because we didn't name this last week, but we know what can happen when we are not able to love ourselves. And there have been some high profile deaths by suicide um, in this last month. And I wanna name the pain that is present. And I want us to know, as we looked at the scripture last week of Romans 8:38, that the United Methodist Church does not consider suicide to be a sin. That we believe that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the very first thing that that Romans 8 passage lists is that neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we know that God is love. And we know what love does when it sees suffering. And so we know the compassion that God brings. And if God can't reach us in our storm, if God can't calm the waters and the waves that we are facing in this life, then I, for one, firmly believe that God will not be giving up on working to still calm those waves and that storm and to still reach us after this life in the next. And I raise this because this is exactly where our film, The Titanic, starts. This is how Rose meets Jack, um, because Rose's storm has become too much for her. And in this one meeting with Jack, after she's run a huge length of the Titanic, obviously upset with people just kind of looking at her and gruffled that she you know, walked, ran past them and interrupted them, Jack chooses to get involved. If we could look at that clip. Verse 11, beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And in this moment, there was a bit of saving love that happened for Rose from someone choosing to get involved. And so we celebrate the love that can save us. We celebrate those who follow the nudges from the Holy Spirit to come and be there and give that reassurance. Because sometimes the people who need those nudges, who also feel trapped and have a storm, don't get that saving love. And in their feeling loss, pass their brokenness on. Let's see the clip with Rose's mom.
And so we meet the fear that is behind the beautiful crystal and the elegant wardrobes. The fear and the pain that Rose's mom is carrying upon discovering upon her husband's death that there's no money that's left, only a name. And so what to do with the fear of poverty. Later on, after a dinner scene, um, there's gonna be my favorite Irish band, Gaelic Storm, playing a reel, while everyone who is in that um, second class um, down below, we see them actually having fun. So there is a chance to have fun and happiness with less money. Um, and we see the freedom of that movement and, and that place. But we also know that poverty stress is real and can be crushing. And so how do we manage fear in scarcity? How do we believe in a God of love and abide in that love in a way that perfect love casts out fear? Because there are only so many resources available for all of those who are here and there's nothing that makes that more clear than the Titanic with lifeboats only enough to save 53% of its passengers and even those not completely filled. So let's turn to Margaret Brown and lifeboat number six. So from the little research that I've done, Margaret Brown didn't actually sit back down. She threatened to throw Quartermaster Robert Hitchens overboard. Um, and, but we don't ever know if Lifeboat 6 circled back or not. We do know that it only had 29 passengers in its 65 capacity boat. Um, and we also know that Hitchens' fear of being caught in the suction and of others swamping the boat is real, as well as Margaret's brown love and needing to do something with the resources that were available to them to save others was real. Life is not ever gonna be easy. These crises are not ever going to be simple. There is going to be truth that is real on all sides. The problem with fear is how it makes creativity impossible. Because the other boats were able to find a way to both avoid the suction, get one boat empty, um, and get it out and work with the fear of swamping. That the Hitchens and Lifeboat 6 um, let their fear stop them from even trying. So how do we build creativity in? How do we keep love in the point where fear doesn't completely shut us down when, when we come up against scarcity? How do we stay present to live into the best of who we are called to be as followers of Christ? And how do we give love a chance? I firmly believe that our original sin is fear. 
I firmly believe that this is how we are biologically programmed for survival, to protect what is ours, to gather as much as we can to ensure our own safety and those that we are caring for, and to fight to defend what we have gathered. But there also comes a time when that causes more harm. It, there also comes a time when none of us want to be Rose's mother, but are so afraid of losing the life that we know that we pass brokenness on to a next generation. Instead of being able to step through our fear and risk living in a different standard, in a different way, at a different comfort level than what we're used to. I really believe that it is only the grace of God that can reprogram us from fear to love. I think it's something that we will never be able to do alone, but that we can with training, with support, with the Holy Spirit and that whole process of sanctification begin to reprogram ourselves and rewrite ourselves and how we abide in a God of love and how we confront scarcity. Now we had this sermon and this worship series all planned before the crisis on our borders came. Um, but because we are talking about love of neighbor and because we are talking about how we respond in scarcity, I do want to name this crisis that's before us today. I want to name, like with the truth that Hitchens was raising, that there are a lot of truths at play. I want to name that there is scarcity um, and that unemployment in our country and everywhere is real. I want to name that there are awful things that have happened to families here in our state and in all of the states here in the United States with factories closing and jobs being sourced elsewhere. I don't want to ever undermine that brokenness and that pain and how much fear that that legitimately causes. But I also want to name that there is other brokenness and other fears outside of these experiences in addition to them. And I want us to be able to acknowledge the scarcity that we're all working with, but also work with it not from fear, but from love. The Bible is very strong in its call. And again, these scriptures were, were chosen before today, but I want to read um, from Jeremiah here because the Israelites knew scarcity. They were the enslaved people that God came to rescue and to deliver. But instead of learning God's lesson in the wilderness with manna, that there was a way within scarcity for all to have enough, for all to gather what they needed, none having too little, none having too much, instead of being able in the promised land to set up a manna society, we got another pharaoh pyramid with some at the top and the alien, the orphan, and the widow at the bottom. And so from Jeremiah, at the steps of the temple, the institution that's supposed to be ensuring that everyone is, has what they need to survive is instead taking. And so Jeremiah the prophet calls out, if you truly reform your ways and your actions, if you treat each other justly, if you stop taking advantage of the immigrant, the orphan, or the widow, if you don't shed the blood of the innocent in this place or go after other gods to your own ruin, then only then will I dwell with you in this place, in the land that I gave to your ancestors for all time. And the part that we didn't read was Jeremiah going on to chastise the people for thinking that they can trust in the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Those are the deceptive words that John read at the end of verse 12. And God is saying, 
from verse 11. Do you regard this temple which bears my name as a hiding place for criminals? I can see what's going on here, declares the Lord. Just go to my sanctuary in Shiloh where I let my name dwell at first. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was housed before the temple was built. And see what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. When Eli and his sons became evil and began taking instead of ensuring care um, over Shiloh when they were appointed there, um, the Israelites went out to fight the Philistines and God did not go with them. Um, and they were killed and the Ark of the Covenant was taken. And so the point that God is making is trying to ask the Israelites to relearn the lesson God thought that God had already taught them that it doesn't matter their name. They aren't the chosen people. What matters is that they were brought out of Egypt because they were the ones who needed to be brought out. And if that they flip and, and instead become the ones who are doing the harm, then God will leave from being present with them. So how do we not be the ones who do harm? This is not a political partisanship moment because there were atrocities happening under the Obama administration with regarding to immigration and deportation that the media did not fairly cover. And President Trump signed an executive order today, or not today, but signed an executive order this week ending the separation of these families. But the fact remains that we use the lives of children to teach their parents a lesson about scarcity. But what are the kids learning in the tent city? And how are we going to help reunite them with their families? How are we going to show love in scarcity? How are we going to be the people and the nation that God has called us to be? How are we going to work with God so that God can help us dismantle our fear? Not so that we don't wave away that there is a scarcity problem, but so that we keep our creativity and our wits about us for how we can actually build in reform that cares not only for the scarcity in our nation, but the scarcity in others as well. And how do we, as citizens of the kingdom of God, hold our officials of this country, both red and blue, accountable to not use this, to not use children's lives as a pawn in a midterm year to retain a, another seat, but to actually work together to solve a moral crisis? How do we abide in God's love? in a way that that love, that perfect love, can cast out fear. This is what I have been wrestling with all week and would invite wrestling with from you. I did more study on what happened to the Titanic. And I want to read uh, just this bit from the Encyclopedia Titanica. Um, it was just fun to go there for the reference. Um, of what happened. This disaster, this tragedy happened, but here's how our country and Great Britain in 1912 responded. Immediately after news of the Titanic's loss began to reach the United States and Britain, committees began to be formed for the purpose of investigating the causes of the disaster. And America, Senator William Alden Smith of Michigan, who had been the driving force behind a great deal of the railroad safety regulations passed by Congress, organized an inquiry within days of the sinking. Beginning on eight, April 18th, just as the Carpathia docked in New York with the Titanic survivors, Smith and his committee began subpoenaing certain individuals, all to testify before them. The in of inquiry officially began at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York on April 19th and lasted six weeks. The British Board of Trade inquiry began on May 3rd, 1912. Heading the group of five assessors appointed to the court was Lord Mercy, the Commissioner of Rex. This inquiry lasted five weeks, emphasizing the question of why the disaster happened rather than following the American inquiry's emphasis on how. 
96 witnesses were called to testify, most of them officers and crewmen from the Titanic, Carpathia, and Californian. Both the American and British inquiries would, in their final reports, devote a great deal of time towards making recommendations concerning the safety of life at sea. Both committees began both committees came to the conclusion that the existing regulations were far outdated and needed immediate revising. In addition to general proposals for improving safety conditions, the areas they focused on the most were the conduct of wireless operators, actions to be taken by ship's captains in the presence of ice, lifeboat regulations, and ship building codes. A horrible thing happened, and there was immediate policy response for how to keep it from happening in the future. And that's my prayer for us. A horrible thing has happened in the separation of children and the detaining of families. So how can we review the policies that caused this? And how can we make a way that there can be a little bit more of enough for all of us? Not just in filling all of the lifeboats that were there, but in actually getting enough lifeboats to cover because those lifeboats that were on were exact number that were required by the laws of the time. So how may we be part of saving love? Love that gets involved and love that casts out fear. Let us be in prayer and in action. Our discipleship commitment is just this to choose how to be involved, and to do what Rose's mom could not, to sacrifice some of our comfort for someone else's survival. Abraham and I, for instance, are looking at liquidating our vacation funds and how to get that to legal fees to get families reunited. How can we give up something, not, not our survival, but something that will help to make the survival of others so that we can combat the scarcity that we are all suffering from. <laughs>